Hi guys, how are you going friends? Look, I've got some exciting news this week. I've had a few extra purchases, some acquisitions of gear. Uh, for example, you can, I'm now actually shooting simultaneously with two Nikons. I've got the Nikon Z6 over this side and the Nikon Z7 over there, and they're right beside each other, and they're filming at all the same settings. And the reason what I'm going to do today, the, the whole principle of this video, is it's another one of those ISO tests. Because, you know, I've heard a lot of reports saying that, oh, you know, the Z7 may be not quite as good with the ISO in low light conditions as the Z6 is. So uh, what we're going to do is a comparative test with a side-by-side -side arrangement, both using 50mm focal range with the S lenses. And what we're going to do is compare them at all the same settings, so it'll be the same video rate, same shutter speed, same ISO, and we'll just keep increasing that ISO. So right now I've got a lot of lighting on, just to do this introductory part of the speech and show you a few of my products that I've just got. And uh, what I'll do is I'll turn that lighting down right down to its minimum setting. I'll have this moment there's four panels of LED shining at me at their full strength. Well, what I'm going to do is turn down to one of those four panels and that at its lowest level. And then what we'll do is we'll start cranking up that ISO in exactly equal increments and we'll see how they look as a side-by-side -side comparison, which I'll put like a split screen view up on the, uh, on the video, I'm sure, and then show you some full screen footage and compare that as well so you can get some detail. So I think this will be an interesting test today. It might answer a few questions of many people because probably not everybody has the Z6 and the Z7. You might have a couple of Z6s or two Z7s, but to have uh, one of each is a bit of a luxury, so we're going to do this comparison, see how we go. Now, I will state I didn't have, of course, two identical lenses, but I do have two lenses that both work at 50mm. So I've got here the 50 1.8S, uh, which is a good prime lens, at 50mm, of course, because that's the only choice you get. And uh, then I've got the 24 to 70, uh, which I've set at 50 mils to equal that out, and they're both starting off at f4. So because it's equal that way, one has an advantage over the other, it's just the same focal length at the same f4 setting, it should be a very fair comparison, or at least as fair as I can make it anyway. So we'll make some allowances. Uh, so what I've done is to be as fair as possible, I've actually put the prime lens on the Z7 because that has the reputation of a lower quality of ISO boosting. So by putting the uh, zoom, perhaps, on the Z6, I think that any possibility that the prime is a little bit better than the zoom in optical quality should be balanced out and give a more fair comparison. So on the subject of the lenses, I have uh, some lenses here as well. And I've just recently picked up, and I mean by recently, uh, two days ago, the 85mm 1.8S. It isn't sheer beauty. This is beautiful. I love this uh, sort of like satin black finish that they have at the moment. It's very metallic sort of looking and I quite like it. The lens is gorgeous. It gives a great out of uh, focus area and bokeh and it's uh, beautiful to use and the focus ring is very very smooth should you wish to use uh, manual focusing. Of course I didn't buy it for that. I like the autofocus on these cameras and that's predominantly what I'll be using and I'm really loving the fact that I've got uh, the full sensor array of areas to pick focus on. So in the old days with the DSLRs, what did I have to do? I had to use back button focus, sort of compose the shot a bit and get focus, and then I'd have to uh, then recompose to fill the frame. And it was really annoying because very often, you, well, you're cropping the image for a start in order to straighten it up again, and then secondly, you got the chance of missing focus because you're actually moving the camera from when you've had focus pulled. So with this new system now with the mirrorless cameras, and I can just pick any focus area I want on the full screen, I can compose it perfectly and I don't have to crop or risk being out of focus. So I'm really loving that. I think that's a great feature of these cameras. One of the main reasons that I got them actually. So it's a real handy thing. So the other lens I've got to show you is uh, we're using the FTZ adapter and it's on the uh, Tanika and it's the 100mm 2.8 macro lens. Now why is it that I haven't upgraded to an S macro? Wait, one, they haven't made one yet for Nikon. Uh, but secondly, the point is that I really like this lens. And with the FTZ adapter that I bought, well, it's free, it's with a kit anyway, I may as well make the most of it and use it. And the thing is, of course, all macro photography, or at least for me, all my macro photography, is done manually focusing anyway. So any noise or whatever interference with the FTZ adapter is irrelevant in my macro photography being manually focused. So I may as well just keep it, it's fine, and I'm really enjoying this lens, having a lot of fun with the macro photography on it. It actually makes a pretty good portrait lens too. At 100 mils and a 2.8, that's actually quite reasonable for doing portraits, but predominantly I use it, of course, for the macro feature. You may also see in the background here, you'll see another new acquisition I've got here. That might be a little bit out of focus, but it's the uh, Ronin-S. 
So I wanted a gimbal. I've had a stabilizing system with a belt and harness and a mechanical arm uh, for some time, a Devon Graham Special, which was it was actually really brilliant. It did a great job. But I just I'm liking the electric features of this one, where I can get uh, that nice smooth footage. And I've got some little uh, accessories too. Let me show you an interesting little accessory. Apart from the uh, Ronin itself and its stabilization, I have this little uh, arm that attaches to the base of it. You take the little uh, mount off the bottom here, the little tripod mount, and you screw this in. And of course, now I've got this stabilizing effect for bouncy surfaces. So, would I use this every time? No. But on rocky roads or up and down steps or I'm running and chasing a subject for filming. Uh, yeah, this is actually really well. I tested it out today, compared the footage with and without, and I found that, wow, with this it's really a lot smoother. But it's also a little bit frustrating because you now don't have a free hand to adjust the settings in the camera. If you want to press the buttons and move the camera around electrically, you can't because you've got, got to hold it with two hands. So if you're happy just to really remove all the bounce factor, this is brilliant. But uh, for general use, I don't actually find I'll need it. In fact, I'll probably only use it on the special occasions, but it's great to know it's there if I do wish to choose to put it on. So anyway, let's get back to the test. I've waffled on enough. What we're going to do now is I'm going to start turning all the lights off, have them check the cameras are all set at exactly the same settings, so it's fair, and then we'll go through our test of the Z6 and Z7 ISO range. Hey. Eh? So here we go, we're starting the test off, and yes, I know it's very dark, isn't it? So we're down to that one light at its lowest level, which registers as 10%, and I tell you now, it was still too bright. I had to go put a filter over it to soften it again, another 50%. So it's like it's really very, very dull in here, but it's a great starting point, isn't it? So let's have a look and see how we go. This is, of course, uh, we've got the ISO at 100. Now, I know that the Z7 actually can start off at 64 ISO, but that wouldn't have been a fair test. So we're going to do make sure everything's compatible with the cameras. They're exactly the same settings. So again, it's the 50 mil. We've got 4K at 25 frames a second with the 50th shutter speed. Uh, we've got here ISO at both 100, and then what I'll do is I'll you know, increase it, maybe the next step might be 400, and then 800, and so on. So I'll let you know as we go, and I'll put a little icon up in the corner, as I did last time, and we'll have an interesting test, hey? So here we are again at our next setup. Now we've gone up to ISO 250 with all the retaining of the same settings. So it should be a little bit brighter, but I'm sure it's still you know, pretty dull and unusable as any sort of footage, but it's interesting to compare. So we see how much grain we can see and uh, see how much clarity and brightness uh, we improve as we step up. So next one, I imagine will be about 400 and then we'll move on to 800 and etc. So again, we've moved forward a bit. We're on to ISO 400 now. Both cameras, of course, I keep checking are both the same, that I don't fiddle with one and make a, a variation between them. So they're both side by side. They're both from the same angle. So it'd be very interesting to see and compare the two. So at ISO 400, that's what we're looking at now. And as we go up, I'll keep notifying you and uh, you let me know what you think. You tell me what your favorite ISO level for each camera is. So we've made another level up, we're at 800 ISO now. So this is actually really pretty good. I mean, what I can see in the back of the monitors of both cameras is, man, it looked like it's starting to get quite bright and you started to discern all the details. So I hope you're seeing the same thing that I am. So we'll have a look all in camera later and put up the video and we can compare the two side by side. But uh, so far, it's, I'm starting to see quite a noticeable improvement by ISO 800. Next increment will be about 1200. So here we are at ISO 1250. That was the next increment up of any significance anyway, so I hope you're enjoying it so far. I think it's starting to improve quite well. It's, it's getting close to a usable image. I think it's about 4,000 is my guess, uh, this sort of lighting and conditions, until it's actually something you post online. But at the moment, we're starting to make some sense of what's going on around us in the room. Uh, I've got a lot of black objects here, so of course I leave things such as the lenses here. You've got the microphone, the arms, and the DJ Ronin, etc. As well as the white wall and the various colours behind me. And of course all these things help to sort of discern what's going on and how they're looking. Now one point I should make is also the cameras are both set uh, internally and on the lenses for manual focus. So I set focus at about this level here uh, when I was on F4 and starting off and I had the bright lighting at the introductory speech and I set focus all manually so that way that there's nothing that's uh, interfering as far as autofocus struggling in the dark which could have interfered with the quality of the image. 
So uh, here we are, we're at ISO 2000, so we're starting to crank it up quite now, aren't we? Started off at 100, and then 400, 800, 1250, and now 2000. So we've actually gone quite a step up. I think about this stage, we should start to be noticing some differences between the two cameras. If there is a difference that exists, about this point on is where you're really starting to notice any noise in the darks and shadows. So I'm as keen as you are to see the results and to know what camera I can rely on for what situation. In fact, what we might find is that they might be almost identical up to about ISO, say 4000, and then as we increase on to 6400 and so on, that's probably about the range that you'll start to notice anything discernibly. Before that, it's probably almost you know, impossible to tell between the two, because it's not like the Z7 is going to be terrible, it's just not going to be quite up maybe to the standard of the Z6, so, you know, proof is in the pudding. So here we are now at ISO 3200. So we're starting to get up to that ideal range of 4000 and above for this sort of very dark lit environment. So I'm just reiterating again, we're using one LED panel. It's one of the Aperture Amarin uh, 672 LED panels, quite popular in the industry. I've got it down to its lowest level of 10%. And uh, I've even got a filter over the front of it to diffuse it, to even soften it some more. So it's uh, about the lowest lighting that I had ever used for anything, and I thought it'd be a good starting point. We're still using that right now, and as I say, I'm definitely checking to make sure the cameras are both at all the same settings at the same time, and they're filming, you know, simultaneously together. So it should be interesting comparison. Next level up will be somewhere over 4,000. I'll go and check about uh, how it looks and how much brighter it is before I uh, confirm that, but I'll let you know in a sec. So here we are guys, we're at ISO 4000 finally, and now it's starting to get a pretty decent image from what I can tell on the back of the cameras. It's looking bright enough you can make everything out and it's looking quite clean. So from how, now on what I'm going to do is go up in 1000 intervals. So it's at 4000 now, it's a good round number, then from then on it's uh, 5000, 6400 and probably 8000. And uh, I don't think I'll do 10,000, it's probably a waste of time, I know it does get a bit grainy by then. But it's in that range that I'm most interested in, it's between 3200 and 6400. That's really the ISO range that I would work at. Anything in excess of that, I think it's ridiculous. Just buy some lights or uh, wait till it's lighter. Okay, so here we are, guys. 5000 now, the ISO reading on both cameras. Now, you know, I get almost a little bit out of puff doing this because <laughs> every time I change the ISO, I'll get it up and get down and get up and get down. Yeah, it's quite uh, funny. So we're always trying to get back in the same position or at least something similar to it. So I hope uh, it's, you're enjoying the test so far. I think there's going to be some interesting results and but certainly from this point on it gets very exciting. So I say 5,000 now, next increment will be 6,400. So here we are at my expectation of around ISO 6400, which I thought would be the best result, considering the very dull lighting we had. Now I think the image looks pretty good in the back of the screen, looks certainly bright and clean. I don't see any noise visibly in the back of the screen, but of course that's too small, isn't it? So we'll check that out on the big monitor and compare for ourselves how they look. But I'm just very excited with how it's all going. As I say, the back of the screen, I can't tell any difference, so it'd be very interesting to have to maybe go up 100% or 200% in the corners to see exactly what's going on. But so far I'm pleased. I think they're both performing very well and I don't think you'd be disappointed with either camera. So here we are at ISO 8000 now. Now we're really cranking it up now so you should be able to pick out any noise or artifacts or distortions in any way now. I'm very keen to see the footage. I think it's looking great in the back of the monitor as I've been saying all along. I mean in the monitor you really can't tell much difference. They both look equally as bright. They both look equally as clean. The only thing I did notice I must admit is I think the Z6 has a different color shift and that's probably my fault. I'll probably set it in camera a slightly different uh, profile maybe a little bit more you know, purple or yellow or something but I'll compare that in detail. So if I make any changes to the images at all, it won't be cheating with the brightness to make one look better than the other. It'll just be I'll try and colour balance them a bit more so they're more equal in how they compare visually with each other. But uh, certainly won't interfere in making one sharper or, or one flatter or anything like that. It'll just be maybe a bit of uh, colour correction to balance them out. So we finally got there. We're at ISO 10,000. I say I'd never go any higher than that. Uh, I think I'd rather just bring some lights with me than try and deal with whatever noise and deterioration of the footage we get. But uh, comparing the two together, it'll be interesting to see. 10,000 is as bright as I would ever go, so I'm not going to go any further. Don't please tempt me to try some ridiculous 25,000 ISO. I'd never use that, and I don't think you should either. I would never recommend it. But I think things are going well. I hope you enjoyed the test so far. I do what I can. Every now and again I'll put up another video as I get inspired with something or buy a new product and want to review it. 
and I'll show you all about it. I'll do some uh, work. I've uh, got quite a busy weekend coming up where I'll be using that Ronin. So I'll give you some test footage on that and give you a review on its performance, how I've went. And then, of course, I'll compare that with the Steadicam, maybe do a side-by-side -side so you can compare the two. I've got some new lenses coming as well very soon. I've got the 14-24 uh, to 24 wide angle, which, of course, are predominantly going to use on the Ronin. And that'll be handy for doing the following people around because I can get in tight areas and rooms. Architectural photography would also be very good and landscapes with that lens. So it is an F4 lens, that one, as some of the others are too. I don't mind the F4 because it just means my subject's going to be in focus. And if I, you know, if I want to use something that's a bit shallower and get that uh, brighter image, I can use the 50mm that I have here at 1.8. And I can actually still use that on the Ronin. So you might think, oh, why would, don't you only use wide angles on that sort of thing? Well, no, you don't have to at all. Because of the uh, extra stabilisation, we've got stabilisation in camera, we've got stabilisation with the Ronin, and then any other stabilisation I can put in post-processing on, I use a warp stabiliser or something, uh, using some sort of a 50mm prime to get that bright or shallow depth of field for certain effects, still using the Ronin is very doable. So don't, uh, show this, sorry, don't sell yourself short thinking you can only use one type of lens or one application. I'm pretty sure you can use pretty much anything with them and I'll be demonstrating that in the future so stay stay viewing for those videos. But right now we finished off at ISO 10,000 probably way too bright and annoying but anyway that's where we finished up and I hope you like the test so far. Hey guys so in conclusion of the video my assessment is really that the Z6 is superior for low light video performance but providing you have any sort of reasonable half decent lighting you're really not going to notice the difference using the Z7 or the Z6. It's only that very extreme low light situation where any sort of video suffers in the two. So what I'm going to recommend you to do is not overthink it. Don't be bothered by it whether you bought a Z7 or Z6. Happily use it for video and I recommend just buy some lights. Even though I use the Z6 and it is pretty good at low light, I'm still always using lights. Right now I've got four big light panels and I'm using the Z7 now just to illustrate how good it is when you've got decent lighting. So it gives a beautiful video quality. The sound coming through it is also quite good now. I've got a microphone attached to it. And that, by the way, I'm fixing that problem too. I am actually getting another microphone. This here is a stereo microphone yeah, used for close proximity or you know, if you're in a concert and you want to hear everything but uh, I'm getting a shotgun microphone very soon and that one there is going to be great for roaming around particularly when I've got something on the Ronin and uh, travelling along so give me some nice direction or sound but that's coming in about a week's time and I'll run you through it when I get it but uh, in video review Yes, there is about a 20% advantage to the Z6 in the low light extreme conditions, but let me just encourage people, don't be filming in extreme conditions in super low light. Either bring some light or wait for a more appropriate time of day to film, if possible, of course.